we can um, go to our next speech, which I'm also particularly looking forward to because that's obviously one of the technologies that, um, that he's, he's working, one of the technologies that I'm looking most into, but he's also covering one of the topics which is most relevant for a lot of people here in the audience. So our next speaker, Adam Jackson, is a very successful San Francisco-based serial entrepreneur and investor. He's founded and exited a couple of companies. He's currently the CEO of Brain Trust Networks, the first blockchain-powered freelancer marketplace, which might be relevant for a lot of you in the audience. And his previous company, Doctor on Demand, he raised over $165 million in venture capital. And he has been through the fundraising process at different stages many, many times. So he will share the insight with you on how to raise a seed round and how to win, win the real numbers game. So hopefully you can learn from him how to raise your first seed round. And he'll be also one of the speakers available on the Q&A stage afterwards. So please welcome Adam on stage. Thank you very much for joining us here in Kluge. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. I'm Adam Jackson, uh, co-founder and CEO of Brain Trust. And today, I am going to do my best to help you raise a seed round or help you know what to do when you go to raise a seed round. The thing about raising money as a founder is you might do it one, two, three, four times in your whole life, and you're going up against people that do it maybe 20 times a year for decades. So it's not always a fair fight, and um, I tried to pack in as much to this presentation that will even the playing field for you a little bit more. So uh, first I'll talk about uh, my background, and then I'll go quickly through pros and cons of venture capital, uh, and then talk about how to prepare your deal, and then finally how to win. So I'm Adam, I'm a software engineer by training, uh, sort of turned entrepreneur, been out in San Francisco for about 15 years, uh, founded four companies, uh, twice as a CTO, twice as a CEO. Uh, my first one was acquired by Intuit, uh, second one by Advanced Auto Parts, uh, and then in 2012 I started my third company called Doctor On Demand, which lets you FaceTime a doctor and uh, get a prescription and hopefully save you a trip to the emergency room. Um, and then most recently founded a crypto network called Brain Trust. And Brain, I'm going to shamelessly plug this because I get to talk to all these really smart product people in one room. Uh, Brain Trust is not a company, it's an open network that uh, connects high end product developers, so designers, developers, QA people, project managers, with larger companies, primarily in the US and some in Europe, that need large outsourced projects. Uh, finished. So you know, team staff augmentation, things like that. So this is not Upwork, it's sort of the opposite of Upwork. Uh, and our twist on that ownership model is we don't have any equity. It's not a company. It's a, the only unit of ownership is a token. And the only way to get that token is to refer other people to the network. So refer clients, refer other talented freelancers, and you earn our token. Uh, so we've been sort of in stealth mode building. We're going to launch the network publicly uh, uh, early next year, but we just opened up private beta. So if you are interested in joining us, please go to usebraintrust.com and, uh, and sign up there. So I've been a founder for a long time, but I've also been an investor for a long time. So I've been an angel, I'm uh, probably 45, 50 deals over the last 10 years. Um, and I also, along the way, uh, about two years ago, started a hedge fund called Cambrian. And Cambrian owns Bitcoin and many other digital assets, and it has a long only fund and a quantitative trading fund. So I come at this problem from both sides, both from being a founder and knowing how investors think. Uh, these are some of the firms I've worked with over the, for the course of the last four companies, um, almost 200 million raised. So uh, a lot of people here probably already know some of this, but you know, venture is not for everyone. Not all businesses need to be venture backed. Um, some of the the advantages it gets you, you can, you can attract, sometimes attract better talent, although uh, Don's presentation earlier was really compelling about uh, having, uh, you don't always need to pay top dollar to get the best people. Um, it gives you room to run as well. If you're not sure you're gonna hit product market fit yet, that gives you a lot more time to figure it out. Uh, and importantly, it gives a lot of social proof to new projects. Um, I remember when we got Andreessen Horowitz into our seed round at Doctor on Demand, 
everything just got easier for us. And um, so the, the fact that a lot of these top tier investors do, uh, do a lot of diligence and have good pattern matching, that can rub off on your brand. The cons are immense, of course. Uh, you will eventually lose control of your company, most likely. Um, it can be, time, or, uh, fundraising in and of itself is a massive time distraction. There's almost no way around this on the seed round. Um, and then uh, with, the, with the runway uh, comes the potential lack of discipline. So if you have money in the bank and something's not working, instead of buckling down and iterating on it, maybe you try something else and it could get really uh, messy. So if you do go the VC route, understand it is purely a numbers game. This is uh, sort of an uncomfortable message I'm going to deliver, and a lot of founders don't like to think about it this way, but this is exactly how it works. Uh, so I'm going to run through quickly how much you should raise, how to de-risk the deal, how to find people who will be helpful, and then finally just how to get it done. So first, how much? Um, a lot of, uh, especially uh, folks with engineering backgrounds, they round down on how things will cost. Um, so I always say raise double what you think you'll need. And the other thing is, once you get this flywheel going and you're doing investor meetings and you're telling your story and you're getting better at telling your story, um, you know, you'll go past your target and you'll, you can easily raise more. So just take more. Don't, don't set out to take just the, the, the smallest amount you can because once you're out there and you've done all this effort, you might as well take a little bit more. Um, and then, you know, how to price. This is, this is fairly straightforward, at least in Silicon Valley. Um, you, you don't want to do the, these nosebleed, nosebleed, uncapped notes, crazy valuations on the seed round. Keep it reasonable. It's going to make it easier to get it done. And you also want these early people who bet on you to do well, right? Uh, having too high of a price early uh, can really get painful later. And take it from me, I've screwed this up enough times. Uh, next, you want to really de-risk your deal. So the founding team at the seed round is, is obviously most critical. Do not start a tech company without an engineering co-founder. Just don't do it. Uh, and then secondly, and almost more importantly, have a really strong subject matter expert. So if you're picking a category like healthcare or education or fintech, know everything about it. And, and also know what you don't know. Know what you're going to learn later. Um, when an investor sits down, most investors are generalists. So if you sit down with a seed investor and in 20 or 30 minutes they've thought of something you didn't, there's a 0% chance they're going to invest. And uh, you just look stupid and wasted your time. The second thing is you've got to be a great storyteller. Investors are busy. They have lots of different themes they're working through. They're trying to keep up with the tech. These guys have to figure out AI and machine learning and blockchain. Um, if you can tell a good story, that makes it much more likely he or she is going to come along uh, for the ride with you. Obviously, being a big market. Uh, and then this next one is really critical. A lot of people cut corners on this. Um, you want to do really strong customer development before you even start this seed round process. And what does that mean? It means Go talk to who's going to use this and or who's going to pay for it. Do it dozens and dozens of conversations. This costs nothing, by the way. It's a pain in the ass. It's no fun. It takes a lot of time. But it is so critical. You'll find out so many insights just by asking a list of qualitative questions and then taking, doing quantitative surveys so you have both sets of data. Uh, you may get talked out of starting your business, which what a gift that would be if you can avoid five years of pain working on something that sucks and shouldn't be built. So this is an absolute imperative, is strong customer development. Um, and you, you want to have a clear value proposition. Um, Painkillers are always easier to sell than vitamins. Um, when you're, I've been in this situation so many times as a, as a founder and as an investor, you're, you feel like you're pushing a rock up a hill. No one wants this awesome service or app you've built. Uh, so really think that through before you start. Uh, and then if, if you are live, a lot of people raise a seed round before they have something out there, but if you do have an MVP out there, don't obsess over the early metrics too much. Uh, even if they're good, uh, I, I get this all the time, inbound deals where they have these amazing, uh, amazingly low CACs and you know 100 NPS, and but the the N is you know 50 or 150, and it just just doesn't matter. It's not interesting. Okay, then you got to figure out who's going to be helpful. Um, there's a 
many, many investors out there. Um, who's going to be strategic for you? You might, you want to. You, obviously, brand matters. Um, if you're uh, if you're raising for uh, a service that will serve the West, you have to stop on Sand Hill and, and at least have some conversations. Um, folks that can get you into the next round, very helpful as well. And then access to customers in the community. So this is where corporate venture actually makes sense sometimes. If you're building a media company, go, call, to, go talk to Comcast Ventures. They're massive. Uh, and then, sorry, this is a typo here. I meant to say zero large VCs or a bunch of large VCs. So there are, of course, many seed venture capital firms, and you want to obviously talk to all of them. Um, the, the issue, the challenge with having a large venture firm like an NEA or a Sequoia or an Andreessen Horowitz or Google Ventures in a seed deal is they will obviously have access to do your Series A. If so, if you plan on raising a Series A, you have to really think about this negative signaling problem. If you have GV in your deal and no other large venture firms, and then you go to do the Series A and GV's not participating, that's going to send a signal to the rest of the investors that there is something wrong with this deal, GV's not doing it, so we, don't, we won't even look at it. So you get around this very simply. Either don't let any big venture firms in, that's what we ended up doing with, with Braintrust, um, or pile them in, you know, have five, six, or seven. That's what we did with Doctor On Demand. And that way you can create a little bit of FOMO when it comes time to raise the round. Um, they're unlikely to collude with each other at that point because they're competing with each other. So you can dangle Andreessen Horowitz and Google and Venrock, and, uh, and hopefully if you're executing, uh, you can make that Series A much easier. So then you got to get it done. There's only one way to get these rounds done, and that is through brute force. Uh, investors are really busy. Uh, you might think they'd be interested in this based on their Twitter feed or what they've said publicly. Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Don't count on it. Um, the other thing is that these men and women who, who invest for a living rely heavily on pattern matching. And if you're doing something unique and innovative, it will not trigger or may not trigger what they're looking for, they may miss. This, this happened to us with Brain Trust in spades. We raised a $5 million seed round in uh, November of last year when the whole world hated crypto. It was nothing but scammers and drug dealers. And uh, it's gotten moderately easier now, but you know, we had to talk to something like 75 investors to get 20 to commit. And that was a pain in the ass. And if we had not done the brute force approach, it, it just wouldn't have worked out. And that's with a strong founding team and a long track record. Um, the other interesting things I've seen are a deal could be a great fit for the firm, but it, the partner might be too busy. You know, we had this with, with a very well-known venture firm, and the guy had just had a kid, and he's already on too many boards, and he really loved the deal, but he couldn't get it done. And I, you know, maybe he was just lying to me, but I, I bought it. Um, so there's a, a lot of reasons why You'll come to a firm, and it's just a, such, it's such a slam dunk in your mind, but it just it won't get done. Uh, geography's a big deal. Um, I, I live in San Francisco. I've raised all, all my rounds in San Francisco. Um, I have invested all over the world, though, and, um, and I've seen this. Uh, I, we have a portfolio company in Slovenia, and um, the, you know, the investor ecosystem here just isn't as strong. And so if you're going to raise if you're going to get this done, if you are going to do a brute force approach, you just simply have to come to San Francisco, stay for a month, uh, network with people, and get it done. Uh, I just don't think you can avoid uh, stopping through there. Uh, and, and the last issue you'll, you'll run into with seed rounds is groupthink. So I mentioned um, how unpopular our uh, seed round was for brain trust. Uh, everyone hated tokens. Uh, with the price crash of Ethereum, everyone was all of a sudden right that blockchain sucks and tokenized networks will never be a thing. So groupthink is strong, especially when you're dealing with complicated technologies like blockchain or AI. So don't let that deter you. Keep going. Um, and then, you know, the, like I said, just play the numbers. Keep, keep this one thing in mind. This always made me feel good when I had 15 people tell me to F off in a week. There's more venture money in the world then there are good deals. Keep that in mind to keep your confidence up. 
Maybe even say it once in a while when you're in one of these pitch meetings. I've done that before. And I was on Sand Hill, and we were getting a bunch of shit, and these guys were not going to invest. And I said, that's fine. I'll keep moving down Sand Hill Road. Then I'll go back to San Francisco. And if that doesn't work, we'll go to New York. And if we don't get it done there, we'll go to Beijing. Their global capital is cheap. Venture is an over-allocated asset class. They need you more than you need them. Keep that in mind. Also, keep it time constrained. Um, a lot of folks will be having conversations with VCs. If you're talking to a VC and you have a round open, you are fundraising. Don't let this go on forever. Time is not on your side. If you keep a time constrained process, I would say four to eight weeks is ideal. If you still haven't gotten the round done in 12 weeks, it's probably not going to get done, and you're not you're going to not be able to get meetings, right? If people know that you've been doing this for three months and you're still not done, it's unlikely you're going to be successful. Uh, and that leads me to what I call the shock and awe campaigns, which is a, probably an unfortunate, unfortunate reference. But um, do, do lots and lots of meetings. Do 40, 50 meetings a week. Keep it rolling. Get, get the, the buzz going. These guys do talk to each other. Uh, and that can only help you, right? Get, Create a little FOMO. This costs nothing, by the way. All you have to do is send emails and call people. So um, how much do you raise? Well, if you're going to try for a million bucks, you need 10 investors at 100K. You can do the math. You're going to need 10 to 20 investors minimum, no matter how much you're raising. So go talk to 50 or more. Uh, coming up short on a seed round is, is a horrible thing. You, you want to avoid this. If you say you're going to raise 2 million, and you only come up with 1.2, no one's going to feel good about it. You may not even get it closed. Uh, which leads me to my next point, be oversubscribed. If, say you want 3 million, then go out raising one. You'll get to one, you'll say, wow, the demand is overwhelming, we're going to go to two. Keep coasting, then stop when you think you've raised enough. But if you use the word oversubscribed, you're changing the dynamics of the round and, and, and the negotiations. Of course, cash is king. This is less relevant in the seed round when you're on to A and B and C. Being able to just threaten profitability is very, very powerful. VCs love pouring cash into profitable businesses, right? Because if you don't need their money, that's going to make them be safe. Well, like, well, these guys must know what they're doing if they're generating free cash. This is less important on the seed round. Hey, good luck. I'm on Twitter, LinkedIn. Happy to help. Thanks.